Coffee and breakfast is on. So right here, I'm standing on the border between Quebec and Labrador. Another interesting thing about this boundary is that to my right, all this water flows to the Labrador Sea in the Atlantic Ocean, and all this water flows up to Ngava Bay in the Arctic Ocean. So if I pour my coffee right on this line, half of it's gonna flow to Ngava Bay Half of it's gonna flow to the Labrador Sea. Yo, don't waste too much coffee though, eh? No, but see that flow, it's, it's separating perfectly. Perfectly! No, there's some pretty cool phenomenons going on over here. What, what do we got? So these are known as erratics, and they've been dropped here from glaciation. And what's really cool about these is that they're eroding in place through wind, rain, and freeze and thaws. You can see it, it's literally breaking down in place and eventually it's just going to be a pile of, of rock and you can see older versions right over here they look like big ant hills but these were once rocks and eventually it'll become the topography over time that'll be a new hill it'll be a new hill noah's hill Got a uh, 31 inch lake trout that's been grilled and then diced up. Nice full frying pan's worth, really. The other question everyone's been dying to ask, where did you get that styling watch? Ah, yeah. You're bedazzled right now. It was a last minute Walmart special for the trip. <laughs> that's been like our lifeline for getting up early because no one thought to bring a watch before we got to Lab City. I think we accidentally pressed the stopwatch button a while back. It's just been running ever since. <laughs> We're up to like three or four days. Noah, how are you feeling? I feel a little rough today. Yeah, you're feeling a little rough. Yeah, my stomach's, you want me to take back over? My stomach's been hurting. Which has been, uh, on your mind a bit? Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like every time I burp, I might puke. But it's one of those things you gotta you gotta go through. Oh my God! Come paddle over and check that out with them. Oh yeah. That's insane. It looks deep, eh? It does look deep, doesn't it? I'm curious how far down this goes. It's a long way, I think. It, you know, it's definitely glacial. Like it has to be. So it's probably just a straight drop. But Is that dramatic? Unbelievable. You can still see some snow over there in the distance? Yeah, I just saw that, man. So oh, cool. that way. We may have just rolled in on our nicest camp yet. Take a look at this place. Beautiful mountains. We got a breeze coming in off the lake. And we've got some premium camp spots. Lots of firewood. Really doesn't get much better than this.
love that standing deadwood. Gotta love it. Dry as a bone. So up here in the north, once trees get to a certain size, they're pretty well established. They can live for quite a long time. And you can kind of see with the rains here, we can't count them because they're too close together, but this tree is quite old, even for being so small, because the growing season is so short up here. So the one thing that can really do these trees in are porcupines. And if you see the bark is stripped in an interesting pattern here, and you can even see the teeth marks as the porcupines have come in and they chew and they eat the inner bark. That's how they survive. So what this, this porcupine did and how this tree died is it girdled it, which means it went all the way around. And by doing so, it removed the tree's nutrient transfer system from its roots. So the, the tree could supply sugars down to the roots through the internal uh, transport systems but the inner bark here will transfer nutrients up to the leaves or the needles in this case, keeping it alive. And without that, the tree dies. And that's what the porcupines have accomplished here. And then what we accomplish is by getting ultimately perfectly dry firewood. Yes, we got wonderful dry firewood standing, waiting for us. So thank you porcupines, you're do doing us a big favor here. <laughs> Definitely. So it is the morning of day 19 and we're just having a quiet day out here on our beautiful beach site. Noah's not feeling so hot today. He's uh, got a bit of a stomach bug of sorts. So we're just kind of taking our time this morning. It's a perfect spot to be able to go explore. We're actually thinking of climbing that mountain. Dave and I are just gearing up right now for our hike today. Revolutionary new gear setup that we've got going on here. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And it's all, a lot of it's in the details. A really nice thing you can do for yourself is tuck your pants into your socks Ooh. so that when you put your dry pants on, they don't ride up or down and everything's in one nice spot for the whole day. And then another thing I do is I have these neoprene booties that I like to put on. Well, I don't like to put on. <laughs> but I put on anyways, over top. And then they protect the dry boot part of the pants. Many abrasions that are inside of my running shoes. Won't actually get through and cut your dry pants? Yeah, it won't actually get through and cut my dry pants. We put on our base layer first every single day. I've got a nice uh, quick dry shirt on here. I've got my quick dry hikers, pair of socks, now with Dave's new tip of tucking my pants into my socks so that they don't ride up, I take my dry pants, completely dry on the inside because I took the time to dry them out on the fire, slide into this puppy. We're just going to go into my Crocs for now. I tuck all of that inside, do up nice and tight. And then these puppies, I'm just going to slide directly into my soaking wet shoes. It can be a little cold. Sometimes we heat our uh, shoes up just so that you don't have to put your feet into uh, something cold in the morning. And boom, dry pants are on. I've got a rain jacket that goes on over top. And this has been essentially my setup for the entirety of this trip so far. Gives you a nice warm place to put your hands too. 
There's no that, pockets, so sometimes you just don't want to hold your arms up anymore. Because <laughs> you've been holding up like packs and stuff? 20,000 paddle strokes in a day. And then I always have my Crocs waiting for me at the camp for the end of the night so that I have something dry to change into while I dry out the slight moisture that you will get in here from like sweat or whatever. This has been a setup that has absolutely changed our lives out here and it's a necessity. Like there's just so much swamp and tracking up rivers. And loading and unloading the boats every day. The water's freezing. The water's cold. Like it, it just wouldn't be possible without it. So super revolutionary. If you're not trying it already, just try it out. Just climbing around out here, it's been crazy how cool it is. Oh. Look at that. Whew. Barely any eyes will ever lay sight on what we're looking at right now. If this was in a more populated area, it'd be a national park. It'd be a million tourists up here, but there's not. Because I'll tell you, this isn't an easy place to get to. It's actually very hard. So worth it. This is pretty cool over here. You can see the definitive change where the tree line is and where you enter like just these barren, barren hills. But all around that lake is just forested. So it's pretty clear that we have something rolling in. As you can see on this side over here, pretty clear. But as soon as you start heading this way, it becomes a misty wall. Probably some more rain. Classic Labrador. Wind has died down a bit, so the bugs are like, yo, what up? I'm gonna come hang out for a bit. And they're like, I don't know if I really want you to hang out right now, to be honest. But then they're like, yeah, we're probably gonna hang out anyways. And then they just pick at your head, and your face, and your eyes, and you inhale them. Whatever, they're annoying. You try to just distract yourself with the beauty out here, you know? Maybe you don't know. Maybe that's why you're at home right now. And you're like, geez, I don't know. The views are really nice, obviously, but I just don't know if it's worth it. It is, it's worth it. Get out there, go explore, climb a mountain, get eaten by some bugs. It's all good for you. Crazy to think that we are halfway on this trip right now. A little over halfway, day 19. Still feeling pretty good. Beginning of the trip, day four, day five. You're just waking up, you're like, wow. It's only day four of 35. And it's hard to like wrap your head around the fact that you're going to be out here for another 30 days, another whole month, one twelfth of a year. However you want to think about it. You take it a day at a time, you fall into a rhythm, the days just start going by so fast. Can't tell you how many mornings I wake up after a tough day the day before and you're just like, I, I honestly don't know how I'm gonna get through another day. And then it just seems to like you blink it's like six o'clock and you've just hustled all day. And you're like, wow, where'd the day go? And now all of a sudden we're here at day 19. The amount of time that we have left in this trip, 16 days, is longer than my longest trip before this one, which was Wabakimi, 14 days. It could be easy to get overwhelmed by the length or difficulty of a trip. You take it day by day, 
step by step, eventually you've got yourself a 35 day trip. Surprisingly, it goes by really fast. One thing that I've really noticed on this trip, just with how demanding it is, the bugs are really bad, the weather can be really tough at times. One thing you really learn is to appreciate the change in things. Some days we have really long lake paddling days and we're like, holy smokes, my arms are gonna fall off, my core is killing me. You're like almost excited for a portage. And then you have a hard portage day. It's like, jeepers, get me back in a canoe. All I wanna do is get a couple paddle strokes in. Or, one day it'll be pouring rain and cold and windy, but there's no bugs. And then the next it'll be sunny and you're like, ooh, cool. Might dry some of my clothes because I'm soaked, but the bugs are really bad, so. And then sometimes the bugs just come and smack you no matter what. The point of my story was that eventually all the bad things just become good in small doses and you appreciate the change between them. I think that's what I've noticed out here. I don't know if that's really like a revelation or anything like that, but it feels like it. So we're having a bit of a rest day today and we're not planning on moving. So we have a nice fire for lunch here. And we decided to take our bannock and one of our salamis and our cheese. I'm gonna pop this in the reflector oven real quick. Are those three bonus ones for the boys? They are. Nice. <laughs> Fried salami. Mmm. It's so good cooked. Oh my god. So much better. What are we looking at in here? We gotta find out if Noah's stuck. Pissing out of his And if his pee is clear. I'm not just reading up. He's been down for a really long time. Let's find out if he's vomiting at all. If he's just diarrhea. I mean, he's been down for a long time. I don't know what time it is, but he's been sleeping for it. Very long time. Probably 18 hours now. Yeah. Not like him. No. Oh, we do have antibiotics. Yeah, but they're in all this way. It's just got to stay hydrated. Backcountry grilled cheese, some bannock, some fried sausage, and some cheddar cheese. Half. Yeah, two mini sandwiches each, I guess. Unreal. Take a bite. This is the moment of truth. Here we go. Hold on. All right. Yep. Did it work? It worked. Oh man. I don't think I can film this much longer. I think I'm gonna need to dive in. Dive in, man. Mmm. Oh, like
boys had paddled ahead of us while we climbed a mountain to take a shot of them. When we caught up, they'd pulled over at a friggin' snowbank. Happy August. I thought it was gonna be like I more icy. Me too. And we're thinking this is snow that just never goes away. Yeah? Probably just stays. It's south facing slope. Most of the snow that we've seen have been on south facing slopes, according to Dave. Because the sun rises and goes through the north. Because <laughs> the sun rises and goes through the north in the summertime. So, the south facing side of mountains, not getting as much sun exposure, hence, we see snow in August. Boom. Dave, what happened, man? Hey, everybody. So, I took out a piece of gum this morning after we got into the canoe. It's a pretty standard, for, standard thing to, for me to do. Keep me occupied while I'm paddling in silence for most of the day. I put it in my mouth and I, I crunched down and I felt something like crunch down in the back corner of my mouth. And I kind of knew right away, but I kind of ignored it for a couple hours while paddling. And uh, I continued chewing the gum on the left side of my mouth here and left the right side alone, but I was playing around with it with my tongue a bit, trying to figure out what was going on, but trying not to uh, panic until we got to the beginning of our portage. And I stepped out of the canoe and I just my brain turned off and I, the gum switched sides of my mouth and I bit down on it again. And out came two pieces of my teeth one, two pieces of one tooth uh, with the piece of gum from the rear top right molar is essentially gone. So after the initial shock of, of realizing that half of a molar had just fallen out of your face, got my buds here to look at it. They, you know, went in there, had a good long look and uh, I drank some hot water to see if there's any pain, and then I did some exertion of the body over the portage to see if there's any pulsing, and I put my head down lower than my heart to see if there was any pulsing, and uh, did all the things, and and really there's there actually hasn't been any issues other than just being a small irritation top of my mouth where something has changed, but we're hoping that the pulp or the nerve inside of your tooth is not inside my tooth is not exposed to the outside world. That way I should be fine for the rest of the trip as long as I'm very conscious about what side of my face I'm chewing with and what I'm eating. Otherwise, if the pulp is exposed, there's a high, a very high chance of an infection setting in, which in, in the teeth is never a great thing to have, any kind of infection really anywhere, but face pain tends to be some of the worst kind of pain. So I've have experience with this from the past, so I happen to know what I'm talking about. Three years ago, I lost this tooth on an expedition, um, but this tooth was dead. I had a root canal on it previously, uh, and it broke when I was trying to untie a frozen knot, so it was my fault using my teeth as a tool, but it, the, the nerve was gone. There was no nerve in it, so it's kind of similar to what's happened here. 
but there is a nerve in that one, so I'm not sure what's going to happen next. Uh, but we have lots of painkillers, and we have lots of two different kinds of antibiotics as well. There's not really a whole lot a dentist would be able to do, even if I were to walk in tomorrow. So we're just going to play by ear, go to bed early tonight, get some rest, write in the journal. It's crazy. I went to the dentist before I left, I got everything checked up, I got everything fixed, I got the go-ahead. Even have it, I have a fake new tooth at the dentist office waiting for me when I go back. So I'm gonna go get a new tooth and ask for a new one at the same time. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. It's like one of those things on these trips is like, we plan for so much, but you can never plan for everything. Yeah, and then I, I brought, I went to the dentist, I got dental putty, but like, maybe it's sitting in the dashboard of my truck right now. Like, who knows? I can't find it in the first aid kit, so. If it does get bad, I do have cloves, which we can grind down or uh, boil in a little bit of water with a little bit of cotton and jam it in there and maybe seal it with some uh, pine sap. You know, we got ideas. I'm just gonna go to bed. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Get a good night's sleep. Thank you. We just rolled over the 400K mark. Earlier today, we portaged out of the Natakwanon headwaters into the Mastastin watershed area. So we're officially, the water that we are in now is officially flowing into Mastastin. Moving our way into the upper Mastastin River. Super exciting. Which is very exciting. Look at those contour lines. From what we understand, this is a very fast, bouldery creek. So very dependent on water levels of what rapids we're going to see and what's runnable and what isn't. Theoretically, you should be able to follow this all the way down. At least going up by the contour lines, and Pat Lutas's notes, there's very little escape routes here, so we're gonna have to be extra careful here, especially given our remoteness. But then, after that little run, finally hit Mastastin Lake, which has been a major goal of this trip. Very, some very strange and interesting stuff, given the fact that it's a meteor impact site and not a glacially formed lake like everywhere else in this area. It'll be a very interesting spot. Looking at all the contour lines on the outside of the lake, it's just like, what is this going to look like? Very, very little information about this lake out there. <laughs> 